Initially, I never thought that the extent of plastic waste pollution can be this devastating. First, we saw the bleeding turtle with a straw, then dead whales full of plastics. Then that movie on YouTube where they opened the stomachs of hundreds of birds finding hundreds of pieces of plastic stuffed in each of their guts. This started to look like the apocalyptic end of times written in our holy books, I thought to myself. Then it gets closer and personal. Each mineral water we drink already contaminated with microplastics. Doesn't matter which brand. 30 to 90% of the fishes in Indonesian waters have microplastics in them, as well as 60% of our salt. It suddenly dawns on me that these statistics speak to my family's dinner table. When I see my daughters eating fishes and my wife adding salt to our dishes, I realize that the statistic about each person consuming one credit card size of microplastics per week is true. I feel sick in my stomach and feel so wrong. To knowingly do nothing and keep feeding our children and our grandchildren these foreign stuff. We consume about 400 million tons of these foreign stuff annually, equivalent to 25 million containers, which you won't be able to imagine that much in your mind. This has been a build up of more than 50 years of habits and unprecedented economic prosperity and mass production fueling fast paced modern lifestyles we all enjoy. All enabled by plastic bags, wrappers, packaging, bento boxes, combs, toothpaste, gazillions types of plastic gadgets, electronics, and toys. The problem is that every single piece of plastic will eventually become waste, and the earth needs 100 to 1,000 years to biodegrade them. About 8 to 10 million tons of them annually leak to rivers, oceans, lands, so we literally are injecting our planet with plastic. Just like climate change, Plastic waste pollution is an existential threat to all living beings. If we don't fix this, the pollution will overwhelm our planet, destroying beaches, oceans, fishes, birds, salt, drinking water, food. We all will die. It's not a matter of if this will kill us. It's a matter of when. Is it when we consume three credit cards a week, five, seven, before our antibodies and hormones go against us, causing COVID-21? 23, 25, but why is it so hard to change? Why is it so hard in effect to save ourselves? So we start researching solutions to tackle this gigantic systemic problem. We spent 10 years of research through many iterations and failures and subsequent seven years of US and Singapore patent processes on our technologies. Our solutions approach is simple. Since plastics take 500 to 1,000 years to biodegrade, and spending much of the transition state as microplastics before microorganisms able to digest them. Why don't we figure out a way to work with mother nature to speed up the oxidation and biodegradation process? So we invented Oxium, our first technology made up of mineral salts that is added in a very small dose during plastic production. This will not change the functional properties of the plastic, but when discarded and exposed to heat, sun, humidity, oxygen, ultraviolet, will quickly initiate molecular and chemical cutting of the long polymer chains of a typical plastic, turning them into a soft, wax-like material that is no longer plastic because of the shorter molecular chain and low weight. This, in turn, enable water to seep in and then consumed by widely available fungi and microbes within six months to two years in landfills, depending on our design with the end result as water, carbon dioxide, and biomass, effectively preventing them from being in the microplastic state for too long and endangering all of us. It's a very effective and cost-efficient technology, suitable for Southeast Asians' hot and sun all year round weather and low income per capita. Some of the fair objections about the technology is that it is still relying on plastic, which is non-renewable, and that it might still go through microplastic phase during its journey towards biodegradability, depending on the natural conditions which clearly vary across the world. But the main point is it's already better than conventional plastics, and that should be a good starting point to keep developing forward. We then work on our second technology by asking, what if we can go further and start replacing conventional plastics with bio-based plastic that naturally biodegrades? So we can start reducing the use of this foreign stuff, synthetic polymer, even though not yet fully replacing them. Therefore, our bioplastic EcoPlus uses cassava or tapioca as Southeast Asia's indigenous crops that can grow in marginal land, 
It's non-genetically modified organism. It has very rich starch content, but lower nutrients compared to our main food crops, such as rice, corn, sago. EcoPlus not only biodegrades at its end of life within three months to one year, but it's also bio-based at its main feedstock, winning on both ends of the equation. We have shown EcoPlus as safely eaten by micro and macro organisms in various tests, including in vivo tests with mice. Additionally, we are excited to be able to use cassava starch from farmers' co-ops at fair trade price, certified fair for, li for life from Switzerland, creating the world's first ever social environmental impact for plastic replacement in our business model. More EcoPlus usage means automatic inclusion and increase of farmers' livelihoods. Additionally, an analysis on a major U.S. retailer shows that by changing conventional plastic shopping bags to re use reusable bioplastics EcoPlus, it can reduce more than 50% CO2 emission. So over the years, we're able to turn most plastic items from shopping bags, food trays, cups, garbage bags, food and non-food plastic film packaging, daily landfill cover, seedling bags to be biodegradable. In the big picture, our biodegradable technologies are part of the ongoing evolution towards fully bio-based and biodegradable, migrating from the current state of majority plastic that are oil-based, non-biodegradable. It's going to help to convert our consumption and production towards sustainability. We thought that's it. Mission accomplished. We have enough to solve the plastic waste pollution problem. Boy, we were wrong. While we get a lot of recognition and support, we also got some pushback. We got hoaxes and misinformation. We got stiff resistance to adoption and even misunderstanding with some NGOs that we thought were supposed to be allies in this fight. We realized that while we have the technology innovation to really change the system, we miss a big piece of the puzzle, social innovation. Social innovation means we need to plan our technology into an overall ecosystem that encompasses the necessary solution fit, contextual fit, and behavior change. First, the solution fit. It's bogus to claim that one solution can handle all the million types of plastic waste. Each needs to solve the right waste type. In reduce, reuse, recycle, for example, there are cases for reduce like what most activists push for. Reducing our single-use plastic consumptions, let's not double bags, many other efforts. These, there are cases also for reuse. Let's bring our own water tumbler, personal shopping bags. But modern mass manufacturing and global lifestyle necessitates many packaging made of plastic or plastic-like material. Therefore, recycling is an important solution where it's economically viable to do so. For example, when we recycle our clean mineral water PET bottles, we recycle them into polyester yarns. But for many plastic films too thin, too cheap, too distributed, too mixed up and contaminated, the fourth R, return to earth, which is to make them biodegradable, is the optimal solution. So we focus on applying our technologies to applications that need to biodegrade at its end of life at landfills, such as garbage bags, plastic cups, food and non-food packaging, seeding bags, and many others. In other regions, the optimal solution for these items could be recapture or incinerate them into energy. So you see, each of those R doesn't need to compete talk bad with each other because each of them have their own optimal target waste items to handle. Applying wrong R could cause another problem or unintended consequences. I met well-meaning youth activists who were campaigning to ban all plastic bread and instant noodle packaging. He asked, Mr. Tommy, why can't we go back to the good old days before plastic and wrap all these breads with banana leaves? I nodded and felt their frustrations. But then I asked, have you calculated how many bread we produce every day and distribute it to 15,000 islands in Indonesia? No. How about 7 million bread? So 7 million yesterday, 7 million today, and 7 million tomorrow and every day afterwards. How many banana leaves do you need and how many trees and hectares of land for it? He's shocked on the scale of the challenge. Also, if we use banana leaves, the moment it rains, the whole batch is gone. It won't make it to the outer islands and it surely won't last beyond a day. How about contamination? Plastic protects and prolongs the food to five days or more. Instant noodle packaging presents a similar challenge on an even bigger scale. 
Indonesians eat 12 billion packs a year. Go figure, we really like our instant noodles. So yes, we can ban the plastic packaging and have less waste, but then we will have a major food shortage problem. Therefore, one of the good solutions for this small but critical packaging is to make them biodegradable. They really appreciate the discussion and both sides really learn a lot. Second is the contextual fit. A solution fits in one region or country may not work in others, so we can't simply copy paste. Each country's geographic size and complexity, income level, maturity of infrastructure, weather conditions, cultural behavior, affect the optimality of the solution. For instance, when a good friend and circular economy expert from a European country came and taught us about the efficacy of recycling over there, I asked, in Indonesian context, given how spread out and complex our geography and messy our infrastructure is, it would take, for example, $1 to collect, sort, separate, and thoroughly wash, using much water, the plastic waste such as garbage bags and smaller packaging, and then chop and recycle them, and they're worth five cents on the other end. Two questions. Who will subsidize the 95 cents where we need the budget for education, healthcare, and many other needs? And two, is that circular economy to burn 95 cents of cash to fi save five cents of material? After thinking through hard, he acknowledged that it's probably different in Indonesia. Yes, of course. Given the different context, there are a whole lot more cheaper, smaller packaging because as our income per capita is less than 10% than typical Europeans, people can afford smaller items. So a whole lot more plastic waste is not economically viable to recycle, even though technically viable. But then again, in many developed countries, there are many uneconomical plastic waste still being exported to developing countries because it's cheaper to be processed here, which most people agree is wrong and unjust model. Lastly, the, for the people to use our EcoPlus as a reusable bioplastics that will biodegrade safely at its end of life, for instance, won't be achieved if the corresponding behavioral change doesn't happen. Thus, we as social entrepreneurs will need to work with NGOs, local and national governments, investing in educational outreach programs and advocacy to affect the necessary behavior change to actually reuse. We also need to support the relevant waste management process to make sure the worn out bags do go to landfills to biodegrade. Finally, all the above needs to be wrapped in the right mindset, which is less ego and more eco a humble ego to acknowledge that each of us only carry a piece of the puzzle that we need to weave together towards an overall solution. An open mind to collaborate and the focus on shaping a vision of a sustainable and prosperous future together. Why don't instead of forcing people to choose or continuously squabble over which solution is the best to solve this plastic waste pollution and who has the greenest technology, we instead agree to fight the status quo the conventional plastic being used with conventional mindset and habit, such as single-use habit. That's our common enemy. All the other solutions need to go and prove themselves. There's not yet one ideal solution anyway, as there are always limitations, costs, and trade-offs on each, whether we like to admit it or not. Let's continue to innovate technologically and socially, give each other the benefit of the doubt to try and work together so we can really create sustainable change. There is still hope. There's also still time, but not much. Failing to do this could mean the irony of us humans as being the most intelligent species on Earth that produce and consume ourselves to extinction. We cannot let that happen. So let's work together. Thank you.